At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. In 2004, our region adopted a bold vision for growth that promotes compact, mixed-use development and more transit choices as an alternative to leapfrog development. That plan is commonly known as the blueprint. In the update since, leaders have continued to work on its implementation and realize the improvements in the quality of life that were promised in its conception. Nine years after its adoption and at the beginning of our region's economic recovery, many want to know what does the future look like and how will today's decisions in building a sustainable community affect the region we call our home. Joining us today in partnership with the American Leadership Forum is West Sacramento Mayor Christopher Cabaldon and architect Bruce Starkweather. So what is the sustainable community strategy that has grown out of this blueprint and are they one and the same? Well, you might think of the sustainable communities strategy as being the, uh, the physical form of the blueprint. The blueprint was really an agreement in our region around where we wanted to grow and how and in the kind of housing diversity we wanted to create, the kind of places. But it was to a map and a set of principles. The sustainable communities strategy is one of the tools that we use to actually put that into into form, whether it's through the uh, general plans, through our transportation investments, but that actually guides the spending of money. The implementation. The, exactly. Okay. All right. And going back in history, Bruce, mm -hmm. you've been involved in these issues as a volunteer from your work on the city's general plan to your service on Valley Vision for years. What is the importance of the future of the strategy implementation on the quality of life for our region? Well, you need to be able to uh, uh, make the, the process work for you, and therefore the implementation becomes your success or failure. The concept of, uh, of the blueprint for me, when I looked at it, trying to bring it down to layperson's terms, its fundamental benefit to us at that time was to give us a view of the future and showed us the results of various types of consequences that we did. And, and therefore created a strategy that if you did nothing, we didn't want to live in this place anymore. Uh, well, that, that's actually a, a good place to jump off at. Mayor Cabaldon, what are the consequences in the absence of the implementation of this strategy? Well, the, the, the consequences for our quality of life are pretty severe. And, and we played around when we, the blueprint was written with all kinds of kind of ideological plans. So, like we, what? We said, like, well, what a lot of our environmentalist friends were saying, hey, just, just let's just do all of our investments in biking and sidewalks and maybe some public transit, and then we'll have clean air and a wonderful Sacramento region. And some of our business community friends said, oh, no, 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 don't spend any money on that. Put all the money into making our freeways bigger and building more bridges, and then we will have no more congestion and our economy will take off. And so a lot of different competing ideologies. And what we learned out of the blueprint after actually running the numbers was they were all wrong. Really? You, you could yeah. build all the bridges and the highways that you wanted to, and you still got more congestion. You could add all the bike lanes and bus service that you, that you wanted, and you still got more congestion Why? and more air. Why? Because it was the land pattern underneath. Right. It doesn't matter if you have great bike, bike paths and sidewalks and bus lanes if everybody's living out so far apart from each other that they can't get connected. And if you just build more wider freeway, freeways with the same land use pattern that we have, keep growing more and more into farmland and into habitat, then people just fill up those freeways faster and faster and faster. Yeah, forgive me, no, Bruce, no. it seems like it's a problem of architecture. Well, it is. It's a design <laughs> process. As, as I've said before, when you start something, I can guarantee you it will not be what you end up with. Mm -hmm. But you have to start somewhere. You have to have a plan. You have to have a concept of the consequences of acting good and acting bad. And I think what Blueprint showed for us is if we did nothing, this was not a place that we either wanted to live in or would appreciate it, what it looked like when we got there. But it also showed us about behavior change and, the, and how difficult it was to change behavior. And if you go back to the ABC. Give me an example. It, well, it, it was the notion that if we did nothing and kept going under the principles we had, 
we would consume way more than we needed to in an extremely wasteful way. If we just adjusted slightly the consequences of these slight behaviors, which most of us would look at and say, I can do that, that's not a big deal, uh, suddenly accumulated to significant outcomes when we went down the road. But how do you respond to the point that some in the private sector has is, is that it's industrial planning. Let the market decide. Things well, go where they're supposed to go. People want to live in the suburbs. Well, you know? if, if I would take this into a discussion about the old economy and the new economy. The old economy and the tools that we had with it, the infrastructure I would call of public engagement, was keep things separated. Keep them in silos, don't interact, and you did things fine. It was easier because, you know, to me, housing and commercial didn't mix. They were in separate silos. But when you brought the needs together for a combined integrated community in a region, suddenly things got complicated and we don't have, or did not have at that time, uh, the infrastructure to start challenging ourselves as to how do you integrate these things. You know, the other thing I'd add, though, is that it was, uh, we were trying to change behavior, but that wasn't the main point. In fact, I thought, w I thought we were going to get, get into a big fight about it from folks who said, oh, we need to get people out of their cars and onto a bike, and let's figure out how to force them to do that. And what we learned in the blueprint development was, hey, what people really wanted was to be able to live near the art gallery, or be able to walk to coffee, or know that their church was within biking distance. And we just weren't producing those kind of neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. We thought everybody wanted to live in cul-de-sacs with five bedrooms, and a lot of people do, but it turned out in that process that there were a large proportion of Sacramento region residents today, and especially potential future buyers, that wanted to live in a different kind of a place, and we weren't producing that for them. Is so it was less about engineering yeah. their lives than recognizing what the un unmet demand really was. Is is this strategy and sort of the principles behind it kind of like the canary in the cave? Because recently I was watching a news report that said that the attitudes and the wants of the emerging buyer, you know, for home ownership or for just living, mm -hmm. is different than it was, say, 25 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm definitely seeing that in West Sacramento on the ground every day. But even the, the region-wide statistics are bearing that out, that the idea that the blueprint was founded on, which was that people want different kinds of housing choices, but we're just not delivering it to them. So we don't, we don't, we don't see them buying it because we're not making it, we're not selling it. Uh, but over the last few years, we have been. And that's, that's been the most popular part of the housing market. And so that theory has really played out as real evidence. And it's one of the reasons why the blueprint is sort of irreversible today is because the people have spoken and with their pocketbooks, they are buying more and more of these, you know, lofts and condos and townhouses in the urban areas where they can enjoy these kind of amenities. Now, I, I just have to say, mm -hmm. I was talking mm -hmm. to someone recently uh, who has, has been a critic of the blueprint and also uh, the sustainable community strategy. And he said to me, he says, Scott, well, it's easy for you. You're an infill real estate developer. Full disclosure, everybody, I am a real estate developer. Mm -hmm. And so if I was an infill real estate developer, I would love all this stuff. But the fact of the matter is, is that there are some people who still want the suburban experience. When they're Absolutely. young and they have their kids, Absolutely. that's what they want. And essentially what this does is it essentially cuts off, short circuits, any greenfield development whatsoever, or makes it so difficult that it's cost prohibitive. And that doesn't help anybody. Well, and, and I think that's a misnomer, because Blueprint did not cut off greenfield development at all. What I did do is it challenged us as to how to do it different and smarter. To, to use the assets and the infrastructure that we had that we were not going to duplicate again or increase extraordinarily, uh, because our resource base has changed. The allocation of resources, the process is far more complicated, uh, I think has really changed the, the calculus of what you do. And I, and I think, so as the region, is to not make it an either or. This is not putting us all in little tiny boxes in highly urbanized areas in apartments over Starbucks. Uh, this is really about how does a, how does a community in a region grow? Uh, part of my premise is, is that uh, our infrastructure, as I call it, politically, uh, structurally, and kind of the process, is, is predicated on, on, a, on an economy started 100 years plus okay, before but let, us. But let me make it really simple. Yeah. So when I was having this conversation, the, the notion that came back was that infill development that follows these principles, here, to, here mm -hmm. for F, uh, forever, you're innocent until proven guilty. On the other hand, on greenfield development, from this point forward, you are guilty until proven innocent. 
and that the hurdles being put into place are unnatural and frankly unnecessary. So, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, you kind of have to rewind to the pre-Blueprint world. Okay. Because even for a sprawl greenfield developer, it wasn't like it was Nirvana. There were, um, there were lawsuits flying everywhere. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers was stopping all kinds of projects. The regulatory environment was making it very hard for all development to occur. You had pesky community activists. Yeah, and, and mm -hmm. neighborhood activists and, and, and folks on the, on the, on the, on the urban fringe. Mm -hmm. And so it was very hard for any projects mm -hmm. to happen. The blueprint broke that, f broke that loose. And, it, and by coming up with a regional sustainability plan, all of the uh, environmental groups and the regulatory agencies said, hey, Sacramento... They, ha they have it together. They have the right vision. And they, we should l let a little bit of the leash out so that they can do these other projects. And so what's happened in the intervening years, it has become easier to do infill projects than it used to be, but it hasn't become harder to do greenfield projects. It's just you've got to do the greenfield projects. It has not. No, you have to do the greenfield projects within the, within the area that we all agreed is where greenfield projects should happen. But for example, in my city, we're entitling thousands of additional homes in traditional green fields and suburbs with cul-de-sacs and large houses and everything else at the same time that we're really? building thousands of urban infill uh, units and so where it's a both and it used to be that it was almost impossible to build urban infill and easy to build greenfield I can attest to that yeah because yes. you know you're out in the greenfield there's no there's no neighbors there's no noise issues well, there's mm -hmm. no anything else um, the, Cal and although Cal's there's voted for it Cal's, there's no infra there's right. for a Melrose <laughs> district right and there's right. infrastructure when you try to build an urban project like around Rayleigh Field and you say oh it's so cheap because there's already the water and the sewer well the water and the sewer is like 150 years old you got to rip it all out and then put it back in it's way more expensive and so part of what's happened over the last few years is trying to make it a little bit more even the playing field for urban infill projects to happen without diminishing the possibility of additional greenfield development let, let me let me take the conversation in a completely different direction there's a, a study that just came out of Harvard and Berkeley on poverty that talks about um, that access to transportation and the way that development has been done in terms of just sort of con concentric rings that move out actually has a very direct impact on the life possibilities of, as to whether a low income individual can actually move up into the middle class regardless of educational opportunities because of proximity to transportation and proximity to jobs. It kind of builds on the work of um, William Julius Wilson, who had a book called When Work Leaves for Inner Cities. Mm -hmm. What are the implications of the blueprint and the sustainable community strategies on uh, helping to address the issue of poverty and economic equity, social equity? Well, it's one of the reasons why the blueprint w had such broad consensus in its development and its support, including and maybe especially from the groups that are traditionally concerned about social justice issues, because uh, it has a couple of effects. One is just the direct investment back in communities and neighborhoods that we'd written off. Mm -hmm. You say, look, why are we built? Why are we acquiring this uh, habitat or this farmland when we've got all this vacant land or underutilized land in the urban neighborhoods that we've forgotten? Let's take the time and the money and the resources to make those great places to live, rather than throw them away as though as though the neighborhoods are disposable. So part of it's just mm -hmm. the direct investment. Also, investment in the support of infrastructure so that if you live there, you can get to work because finally we're going to build a streetcar or a light rail line or a better bus service rather than running a bus every two hours that doesn't run on Thursdays and you can't get to work in it. And so as, as you get a more economic diversity in the neighborhood, government and uh, is forced to make better investments there and more jobs and restaurants and other things come into the neighborhood that create a real economic opportunity. And the last factor is schools. Uh, that as we have folks moving into um, some of our older, more challenged neighborhoods. They're not displacing anyone else because it's all empty lands, mm -hmm. but they are, they are helping to demand higher qualities of, edu of education, in and that's better for everyone right. in the neighborhood. Incidentally, right. just to kind right. of give you the comparison, the um, Sacramento has better prospects, this region has better prospects for income mobility, for a low-income person to move up into the middle class and beyond, mm -hmm. than a city many times our size from an economic output uh, perspective, like Atlanta. Right. And it, it's, in a, it, it's kind of amazing to think that uh, land use choices, the yes. architecture of, yes. of a region, actually has that dramatic an impact on social mo and economic mobility. Well, well, it definitely does. And I think what we saw in Atlanta in a steady mission was uh, 
if you keep behaving as you always have without stopping that behavior, that's what you get. Uh, that, that's at the maximum extremes, and then you see the consequence of that kind of behavior, which is they've, they've committed themselves to a infrastructure that's gonna be uh, causing problems for a long time. I think the beauty of what, what Sacramento Region did is we stopped that behavior and started on a path to integrating things better, which I think addresses, uh, will begin to address the issue that you're talking about. Uh, because the old rules kept things separated. It was far easier to keep going out with the misconception that building new created something better. At the same time, we left uh, the existing and said, let it be, it'll do whatever it needs to so do. So it, it raises a question though as to who gets to be the arbiter of whether something uh, is furthers the goals of the strategy and who doesn't. Now, mm -hmm. recently there was a bit of a controversy because the Regional Council of Governments um, had gotten involved in one issue, Cordova Hills, and there, there was, while that issue doesn't have to be relitigated, the, the real issue is, is whether or not regional planning and regional government should have the ability to weigh in on its subdivisions. You're an elected official, how do you feel about that? I think the, the region has an obligation to weigh in because we're, we are all in it together. And I don't just mean in sort of the classical environmental sense that we're bringing the, the air crosses over the boundary between Walkerland and Roseville and West Sacramento water is affected by what happens in Sacramento. That's all true. Um, and that our economies are linked and that there's no such thing as somebody who just li who's just a West Sacramentan. You know, most of, my, most of my residents work in Sacramento or in Davis. <laughs> Grandma might be in, Rock, in Rockland, church is in El Dorado Hills. I mean, this idea is really only a government idea that people exist entirely within one jurisdiction. So we are all part of the region together, uh, number one. But second is, in this environment, uh, the decisions that we make affect each other in a very direct way. So Cordova, How so? Cordova Hills is an example, but any project like that that's flagrantly far from the blueprint itself, um, risks our ability to get the, all these federal and state regulatory agencies to continue to give us the long leash that we need. But in Cordova Hills case, you know, uh, I guess I will go there on Cordova Hills. According to what I've been told, that there's a strong jobs housing imbalance out on that corridor and that you got to build more housing out in that area. This project was in the urban services boundary and otherwise you're just exacerbating already, uh, you know, uh, overdue or overburdened commutes. So what is it, I mean, how do you rectify a jobs and housing balance there? Or for instance, in Elk Grove, where it is you've got the opposite. You've got a lot of housing, you have very few jobs. Right, but the, but, uh, the, uh, the job, our attempts by planners to, to, to manage the jobs housing balance from above have been utter failures. But part of the reason that we're in the, in the conundrum we are in our region is this focus on jobs housing balances without actually paying attention to well, what exactly are the jobs and what are the kind of people that are going to move into that housing. It's just been a number, a, a soul, just a number. And so uh, that's how we've ended up with these corridors where uh, we thought we were achieving jobs housing balances, but it's still people living one place and then just driving to another place, both of which have great jobs housing balances, but it's still the same commute pattern. Uh, John Shirey, the city manager of Sacramento, when he first <clears throat> Uh, came on board, he, he came on the show and he said, you know, one of the things that I hope that we can get out of in this region is this thing that we're all competing against each other. Competition at some level does exist, but if on, uh, essentially on 99 things, we're, we're all in it together. Mm -hmm. you, from your volunteer work in Sacramento and beyond, do people actually subscribe to that? Well, you know, it's, it's, <clears throat> I don't know if there's an easy answer to that, Scott. Mm -hmm. You know, my sense of the thing, and, and we use Cordova Hills as an example without particularly taking a side in the thing, is it, it clearly is beyond the existing property that is underutilized. And, and it begs the question, why is that happening? Uh, partly because extraordinary long time of investing, uh, the process that takes so long, there is so much uh, committed capital in that that you can't just stop and say, hey, we'll, we'll wait our turn for a while. My question, though, as a community is, what about all this other property that is underutilized? Why are we not uh, taking the leadership to make those things happen? And one of my experiences on the general plan was uh, we don't have a clear vision yet 
of what it is we want to accomplish so that you can turn to the development community and say, I want this and I want it here. Uh, and, and, it, and it's part of who we are as a culture of free market societies and the other, hey, it's capitalism at its best. Uh, the problem for me is that it's still extremely inefficient. Uh, and, and communities, I think, back to your fundamental question on social uh, justice and these others, is, is there's a missing link about personal responsibility as citizens to start not just being engaged from a, I don't like it, but to really pushing the, this is what I want. And I think we're getting there better. It's, it's not an easy process. Well, you know, and that is a frustration, which is you can yeah. tell me everything you don't like, yeah. but you can't tell me, you know, what it is that you, you really, really would like to see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One thing that I want to come back to, because, uh, again, um, I, I hate to keep coming back to this one project, but, mm -hmm. the, but Cordova sure. Hills was a bit of a flashpoint within yeah. the region. There's another issue. You know, um, it's really sexy today to talk about farm to fork. Sacramento, the region, is the farm to fork capital and all that. But ultimately, when you hear that our, you know, the one industry where we truly have a competitive, sustainable advantage, as Michael Porter from Harvard likes to talk about, is agriculture and food. And that, you know, sort of the raw material, other than the intellectual capital at UC Davis, is the land itself. Mm -hmm. So, how do you make those decisions in the future as to whether or not you convert a piece of land that has 30 and it'll create 30 jobs for a short period of time for a new community versus taking a piece of land out that may only create have 10 jobs on it but those 10 jobs stretch out into infinity how are we going to rationalize that? i think you partly do it by what what bruce just implied which is okay the blueprint and the sustainable community strategy has the capacity within our existing land footprint for seven, eight hundred thousand more Sacramento region residents. That's a lot of capacity. And you know, given that the region now is two two point four million, that's we could we could add a, we could grow by a third within the land that we've already set aside for, for urban development. Uh, and so the, the notion that, that we need to go and convert some more farmland or some more habitat land is just not it's a question we don't need to get Incident, at. incidentally the statistic that that uh, I came across it kind of boggles the mind. It says that for every thousand new residents, that if we do things as we did before, it would consume 333 acres of land. But according to this strategy, the promise, which sounds hard to believe that you all are going to be able to deliver, mm -hmm. is that it would only consume 42 acres of land per thousand new people. It does sound fantastical, but if you look at the actual land consumption since the blueprint's been adopted, we're pretty, we're pretty close to that. I mean, one of the reasons why the other one, the, uh, the 300 and some odd acres per, per person number doesn't, doesn't actually make sense in the real world is that we couldn't, even if we wanted to grow that way still, even if we said, hey, Greenfield developers, just keep building like we used to build in the last century, there's not a market to buy that anymore. Right. Uh, and we're going to end up with a big surplus. Really? And a lot, I mean, I don't mean zero market, but, right. there's, but there's also a lot, we have a lot of neighborhoods and a lot of housing stock already in that mode. And so if we overbuild, on the greenfield side, yeah. the effect of folks on the on the property values of folks in Natomas and Southport and and uh, Carmichael and elsewhere in the region um, is going to be a big depressing uh, impact. And and so we're we're trying to protect. Ev it's not just about the as Bruce said, not just about the heavy the you know the highly urbanized downtown core. It's also about protecting the suburban areas of the region that we already have and we can't afford to undercut their value. Okay. All right. Well, well and I think also Scott, did, 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 is you take. Per, uh, Greenfield land out of out of its potential agricultural use, and we'll and we'll define agricultural use versus uh, habitat space uh, or, or underutilized areas. Is that the notion for me as a as a planner is is that you're now committing that to a non open space, non agricultural use forever. It's at least a hundred years. Uh, the infrastructure well, we're, we're having built. having recently been to Detroit, yep. I can tell you that sometimes <laughs> yeah, agriculture forever. comes back. It, it, well, it does. Some of the best is under <laughs> L.A. right now uh, for 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 dirt. Mm. But but I think it's this notion that uh, my premise would be is as a community, there's lots of underutilized areas in our community that have been built either too fast or beyond their useful life for their housing or their physical structure, but the, but the underlying uh, land use is still viable and needs to be recaptured. All right. And we're going to leave it right there, gentlemen. Thank you both very much. I wish you well in your work. And uh, Bruce, nice to have you back. Thank you so much. All right. Scott. Well, that's our show.
Thanks to our guests and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org video.